In general, I don't like doing introductions to these conversations, but this particular conversation feels uniquely charged, uniquely difficult, uniquely important to me that I feel somewhat compelled. Within my world, within my orbit of Jewish, Orthodox Jewish Zionism, people like my friend Sam Stein are often seen as collaborators, as traitors of the first degree. Over the years, I've heard so much rhetoric just designed to write off people like Sam Stein as being naive and uninformed. Political questions around Israel today divide the world. Um, there's divisions within my community around the, the question of Israel and Zionism and, and the Palestinian experience. What Sam and his work represents to me is a bypassing of all those questions. It's a refusal to even worry about those questions because his work and his project is about engaging with the humanity of people suffering in this conflict. His work is just about being a human being engaging compassionately with another human being who can use your help. It's the most basic and fundamental form of empathy. From my perspective, a wide range of positions on the Arab-Israeli conflict are, quote, valid. You know, there's all sorts of, quote, valid disagreements about what happened during the War of 1948 and the War of 1967 and what does and doesn't count as apartheid. And all these debates are, are fine, um, but they have to come from a place of compassionate understanding and a willingness to look at unflinchingly the experience of the Palestinian people who are on the receiving end of Israel's policies. It's unconscionable to support policies and be unwilling to look at the experience of the people who are on the receiving end of those policies. That is unconscionable. It is a huge moral shortcoming. And in extreme cases, that's what we would call evil. This is a very difficult conversation for me because it touches on some elements of current events, some elements of the conflict in Israel right now that are the most painful for me to look at, that are the most painful for me to think about. But at the same time, what Sam does is to me the most inspiring and courageous thing that anyone can do. And it represents the hope, the only hope that we have for the future of the conflict in the region. The only hope for the future of the conflict in that region is this level of courage, this level of moral clarity. Before we jump into the conversation, just a few things to understand about Sam. First of all, Sam doesn't know me very well. We've only seen each other a few times in our lives in person. Nevertheless, I feel a deep connection to Sam. I think of him as a friend. We wrestled together around the same time. Him and his brother coached a high school wrestling team on Long Island. And after Sam went to Israel, his brother continued to coach that team by himself. And when I was coaching a high school wrestling team for a few years on Long Island, I would often uh, see Sam's brother and we would collaborate about scheduling. And so Sam is someone who I've followed at a distance. I've been following on social media. And his social media posts, again, are on the one hand painful to me, they cause me visceral sadness and pain, but they're also deeply inspiring. As someone who's lived in Israel and spent a lot of time in Israel and has a lot of family in Israel and loves Israel, I know it's so easy, it's so natural to just ignore the Palestinian experience. It's so easy to have nothing to do and know nothing about the Palestinian experience. To make an effort to take that step and to become informed and to meet people, to, to form relationships with Palestinians is a totally voluntary gesture. It's something that's done purely from a place of love, from a place of compassion, from a place of moral clarity. And it's filled with negative consequences. It, it alienates you from so many people, from family, from friends, from mainstream Israeli politics. Another thing which I don't know if it was fully captured in this interview is that Sam's work is extremely dangerous. It's extremely brutal and dangerous. I know this because he's very public and transparent about what he does on social media. He 
posts lots of videos and testimonies and accounts of what he's witnessed and what he's been through. And I could just say, um, it's worth looking at that. It's, it's startling stuff that he endures. And um, more than once, he's had a loaded gun pointed at him in a menacing, threatening way. Um, and that's the kind of work that he does. That's the kind of experience and risk and personal danger that he subjects himself to. Again, people can disagree about politics. There's nothing wrong with having different views on politics. But politics aside, um, what Sam is doing is so much more important than that. It's so much more basic than that. It's so much more foundational than that. It's just a person being friendly and open to meeting another person and just being compassionate and to gain a deeper understanding of the conflict through human connection. All right. I'm talking to my friend, Sam Stein. Um, it's been a while, Sam. Uh, I haven't really, you know, we haven't seen each other in, uh, in many, many years, but I, from what I understand now, you're, you're doing like amazing, incredible work um, in Israel, in the West Bank uh, with, with Palestinians, Palestinian kids specifically. And I just, yeah, I thought it would be so amazing to just, you know, catch up with you and, and hear more about what you're doing and, and share some of that with my audience. So Sam, thank you so much for, uh, for talking to me today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for the kind words and thank you for having me. Um, what do you, what do you do these days? How would you describe the kind of work that you do? Um, so basically, uh, about four years ago, I moved to Israel first in Tel Aviv and then for the past three years, Jerusalem, um, and really for all of that, I've just been doing a lot of kind of what we call protective presence activism in the West Bank, basically, um, in, you know, especially in area C of the West Bank, which is the part that according to the Oslo Accords is under full Israeli control. There's a rampant, rampant settler violence from, you know, like far right, uh, Israeli settlers living in the West Bank. And because of the police system and regime and government that leaves, you know, that encourages this and leaves it completely unchecked, um, there are really no consequences for violence towards Palestinians. So what I do as part of protective presence activism, along with, um, you know, a whole network of Israelis, international Jews, and, um, you know, international non-Jews, everyone, is just basically, you know, as requested and as needed, uh, spend time in different Palestinian communities as kind of a like de-escalating presence. Um, it's 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 so every time I explain it, it sounds so bizarre. Um, but basically, just as you know, a privileged um, white Ashkenazi Jew, there are actually legal consequences for attacking me, um, and that means that my presence makes violence less likely. Um, and while I'm doing that, you know, it's kind of, you know, you go and you hope that nothing happens, but anything that does happen, you're filming and documenting and or possibly talking to the police and, and um, army, you know, whoever, whichever legal bodies need to be interacted with. Um, and the footage kind of um, is, you know, very important in terms of outreach, in terms of showing people what's actually happening in the West Bank and on the ground here, and also goes to a few different a kind of network of um, Israeli and international NGOs that do a mixture of legal work and awareness raising with that footage. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you more about that as we go on, and I want to hear, you know, sort of like specific stories and, and anecdotes that you have. But um, is there also a wrestling component to this? Because you and I are both uh, former wrestlers or current wrestlers. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I run a volunteer wrestling club um, for Palestinian kids in a region called Masafar uh, and that I've been doing that for about a year, a little, yeah, almost a year and a half now, um, and kind of how that got started. I was living in this region for three months as kind of part of a long-term protective presence project, and after that, you know, you just, like, automatically kind of make really meaningful connections and friendships with um with the community and i i coached i wrestled in high school and i coached in the u.s for a bit um 
And that kind of always stayed part of my life. And as soon as I got here, I knew that I wanted to keep doing it in some way. And then I was spending time in this community. I was like, oh, why don't I do it here? Um, and, you know, I spoke to some of the adults in the village about it. They were all for it. The second the kids heard about it, they started like trying to tackle me. Um, so we were like, hey, I think they're into it. And did some fundraising, reached out, you know, mixture of like GoFundMe and like bigger grants from like real NGOs, got this mat, had to bring it down, which was super annoying. Um, and since then just have been running practice, you know, more or less once a week for like all the kids in the village, it kind of ended up gravitating towards like a younger age group, uh, more like five to 10. And that's been really, really awesome. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this more, but practice has kind of unfortunately been, you know, on pause since October 7th. Yeah. Um, but that's been like just an awesome way to, you know, um, deepen my relationship with this community and kind of give back in just a, a fun, regular way that gives these kids like a really awesome, healthy outlet to just be kids. Yeah. Man, I mean, the sport of wrestling is such a gift. I've also, I coached for a few years also at a, at a high school in the same kind of uh, uh, league um, as you and, and your brother as well. And um, man, it's, it, you build such meaningful connections through the sport of wrestling. Um, and it's just, it's just a way to like tune out so much in a way and, and to really, um, yeah, I don't know, experience, you know, some sort of growth, like I said, connections, deep friendships, camaraderie, um, and, and I, yeah, so that's just like, it's so inspiring, uh, to see you, you know, to see the pictures that you post and, you know, like, I love that you, you like, et, you, you blot out the faces, you know, of, of the kids and all that, which is, you know, appropriate, but just like, just like the whole vibe and energy of what you're doing is like so inspiring and so, and so beautiful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I still can't believe it's happening half the time. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Um, okay. Let's start from the beginning. So this is a bit of a plot twist so to speak in, in, in your life. Like, I don't feel like your life, me too, right? This is, this is reciprocal. I'm speaking for myself as well. When I talk about you, like, like our, our life wasn't really supposed to go in this direction, right? Like we were raised in the Orthodox Jewish world in the New York area um, with like very sort of uh, narrow views about Israel and the Israeli Palestinian conflict um, that sort of didn't, doesn't sort of a uh, lend itself so much to the kind of work you're doing now, I would say. So, so what changed in your life? Like had, what, what, what sort of brought about precipitated this change where this is the kind of work you got involved in? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, that is, you know, spot on. And I think all of it is like, so, you know, out of left field and nobody expected me, like even wrestling, like I, you know, I started wrestling in 10th grade, kind of just like one of my good friends annoyed me one time enough. And I was like, oh, fine, I'll try it out. Um, and that was like a joke like people in school like teased me about it made fun of me about it i was like this skinny kid that like never really got into other sports i was like my first ever weigh-in i was 98 pounds and i was 15 years old um and i just kind of kept doing it and like you know like a lot of kids sucked at first and kind of just powered through and like worked hard and really started to like actually see improvement and start winning matches um but in terms of the kind of political shift, um, I always I, I kind of say that I, I always um, was kind of marching to the beat of my own drum and definitely was always a black sheep in that world and always kind of noticed a lot of things that I didn't agree with, a lot of things that like really rubbed me the wrong way, kind of really obvious racism and homophobia that was present from like the adults in the community, my rabbis and my teachers. Um, and always had like a pretty, from pretty young age was very critical of my upbringing and was always really willing and able to second guess it. But I definitely would say that that didn't extend to Israel, Palestine and Zionism or any of that stuff. And um, then when I, after high school, I did a gap year. Um, you know, like like in our world, everyone does. It's not even a gap year. It's like high school, year in Israel, college. And I did mine at this illegal settlement in the West Bank. Actually, I had no idea what that meant. I remember the first time I ever heard the phrase, the green line, was after I got into this program. Somebody goes, ooh, pass the green line, such a good Zionist. And I'm like, all right, I guess being past the line is a good thing. 
Um, and on this program, it's like this very, it's, it's, it's a machina. It's like an army prep program. Um, and literally I went there because the principal was like, oh, they'll do Krav Maga. They do Krav Maga. You like it. It's like, you know, like combat sport, whatever. And I was kind of like, yeah, sure. Good enough for me. <laughs> um, and we would like jog twice a week and do Krav Maga once a week and like volunteer, you know, not really sitting inside learning uh, Torah and Talmud all day, like all the other programs. And that really, really appealed to me. Um, and I had an awesome year. I had a really amazing year. I met good friends, you know, a lot of who I stayed in touch with for a really long time and like still really care about. And, but on the other hand, there were kind of like always this stuff that I saw that was like, huh, that, that doesn't sit right. And I couldn't explain it because I knew so little because there was so much kind of suppression of information, like glossing over these basic facts, um, you know, similar to like not knowing what the green line is, kind of the demarcated. Um, border between Israel and the West Bank and what's supposed to be the framework of a Palestinian state. Like all, I didn't, you know, words like occupation that was just like, oh, that's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory and not, and it just means that like Jews don't belong here and nobody tells you that like, oh, occupation is a legal thing with a definition. And kind of living in the settlement would see that Palestinians had different license plates and can just kind of think like that reminded me of, you know, Jim Crow, American segregation. And knowing that there was this checkpoint to get into the West Bank that, you know, I didn't even call the West Bank again, I would call it the Gush or, you know, Yehuda Shimron, whatever. Um, and I knew that we had to pass it to go out, but not to come in. And that just didn't really make sense to me. Like, I had no answer for it. Something was just like weird about that. Like, oh, this is not like a border because it's only one way, but something's kind of off. Um, and I kind of, uh, one of my friends described it as like, I just put that in a box. I'm like, yeah, we're not going to think about that. And then I got to college and uh, one of my best friends who I've been best friends with since like middle school actually also wrestled like in the Jewish league, um, went to Yeshiva in the old city for two years. It's still Orthodox. Uh, we're still super, super close. And he kind of just started talking about the occupation a lot um, and, you know, the injustices that Palestinians face every single day. And that was the first time I had to be like, wait a minute, maybe this isn't all just like anti-Semitic nonsense, because I don't think that my best friend who is Orthodox and went to Yeshiva for two years um, is anti-Semitic. And that, that kind of like started the process. I remember something that like really opened up the door for me to even be able to start thinking about this more critically was he quoted one of his rabbis or something saying like oh you know living in Eretz Israel in the land of Israel is a beautiful thing living in Midinat Israel the state of Israel not so much and that was the first time I could even like separate those two things um and then my last year of college I think my last semester even this this Palestinian guy like a young guy like a college student you know like around my age came to speak at the Hillel Club, like the Jewish club at my college. And he was from Bethlehem, which is right next to Efrat, where I lived. And I remember that really resonated with me. I remember just thinking like, oh, we were neighbors, you know, with egregious air quotes because there's a massive wall in between the two cities. Um, and he was kind of just telling a story, like this really wasn't, you know, like, crazy stuff or anything he was just like sharing his experience and in passing he mentioned needing to get all these permits to go to jordan to fly to the u.s because palestinians in the west bank aren't allowed need permits to enter to leave the west bank and enter israel at all and under pretty much no circumstances i'm sure there's some exceptions but whatever um are not allowed to fly out of ben Gurion airport in Tel Aviv. they have to go to jordan and fly out of the airport in amman so this guy mentions completely in passing, like this mundane side thing, needing to get all these permits to go from the West Bank to Jordan to fly to the U.S. to go to college there. And I remember thinking, like, wait, you had to do what? Like, I, I, I like, it was this American guy who spent a lot of time in Israel, was not born there, didn't have a citizen, didn't have citizenship or anything. Um, just hopped on a plane, landed, and like walked around like I owned the place. Went in and out of the West Bank you know, five, six times a week. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, that's apartheid. And um, 
even after all that, like just having this amazing time on my gap year and even in college, like I was a trip leader on birthright twice, um, kind of always loved my time here. Um, and that never really went away, no matter how much more I learned. So then when I was applying to grad school, I applied to Tel Aviv University and I applied to Hunter College in New York. Um, I got into Tel Aviv and I just told myself like, wait until you hear back from Hunter and then you'll make a decision. And after like a week of that, I noticed that I was hoping that Hunter would reject me. So it's kind of like, okay, we, we don't need to go through this. Like that's a pretty clear signal. So I decided to go to Tel Aviv University and that was already like, I was going for grad school, but knew I was going to stick around for at least, you know, a while longer and kind of decided to get citizenship and move here and, you know, and, but with whoever kind of just like right away knew like that if I was moving here, I, I can't just hang out on the beach and tell me, um, you know, I got to be involved. I got to be like doing everything I can to like actually make this place a just moral place for everyone to live in. Um, and after, yeah, basically kind of landed, reached out to like different NGOs or whatever, and emailed a bunch of different strangers and found this group, uh, this activist group that was like mostly or like really predominantly of um, international Jews and, you know, English speaking community. And that was in 2019, really threw myself into that and just kind of kept going with it. And yeah, here I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's an amazing story. And and I want to ask you more about it, but I just want to sort of maybe um sit for a second with like the 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 tension of this divide, right? Like this tension, the divide that you cross, so to speak, um, between two worlds, almost, you know, um, between a world where it has like a, a very narrow, I would say, um, view on the conflict to uh, a world which has a different view, an alternative view. Um, there's like, I remember what it was like, you know, being on the other side of that divide, right? Like, I remember what it was like, like, and you said this, I'm, I'm echoing back some of the things you just said now, but like the sense, you know, the occupation was an anti-Semitic term, not a legal term. The sense of like feeling like I knew so much, like when I was growing up in the Zionist world, like I thought I was such an expert on Zionism. Like I thought I understood the issue so much better than anyone else. And then over time, I, it was, there's like the shocking experience of like, oh my God, like I've, I'm, I'm so ignorant, you know, and it's like shocking. Um, and yeah, it's, it's so disorienting. Does that, does that resonate yeah. at all? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember like while I was living in Tel Aviv already, um, and like had already come such a long way in terms of unlearning and relearning and, you know, rethinking everything and just thinking to myself, like almost jokingly, but kind of meaning it like, Man, I miss being orthodox and like, you know, living off of that like completely narrow right wing narrative, just that of like the unabashed certainty it offered. It was so yeah, nice. <laughs> like, totally. Like everything I believe in is true. Everything else is wrong and it's great. <laughs> so maybe just like a quick primer for anyone who's watching this, because I'm very mindful of like my Jewish Orthodox Zionist friends who might be watching this. So my own uh primer of, of sort of the way I understand the occupation this may or may not be helpful and you can respond to it when I'm done. But like the sense of like Israel fought two wars of defense, 1948 and 1967. In 1948, Israel conquered land and the, the Palestinians who were conquered became, there was ethnic cleansing so that people were evicted from their homes and it created a, a, a refugee problem. But the people that were conquered became Israeli citizens. And even though there's like racism in Israel and it's like they didn't want necessarily to become Israeli citizens, they enjoyed citizenship in Israel and they can like, vote in democracy and participate in democracy. In 1967, there was another conquest, but those people did not become citizens. Those people became subject to a permanent military occupation where they have the desire for statehood. They have a desire for self-determination. They have a desire for a national identity. And they're, they're being denied that because um, their, their, uh, um, their freedom of movement is severely restricted. Their freedom of building is severely restricted. The freedom of their access to their natural resources is severely restricted. They don't have access to their borders. They don't have access to, to any um, significantly meaningful uh, locus of political power. 
um, it's it's very much uh, a puppet to you know Israeli occupation um, and subjugated in that way. And so and so you have people who who are craving a kind of self determination and kind of freedom, and and they're being denied that. Um, does that accord with your with your understanding of the history? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like obviously that that's you know the history of it is something that can be unpacked for like of hours course. and hours yeah. and another yeah, stuff, yeah. but that's not really broad and accurate. Um, the the basic basically the only thing I would like to add to that is that um, after forty eight, um, you know when all of the Palestinian Arabs living in what became Israel's recognized borders after that, while they were given citizenship in between 1948 and 1966, they were deemed a, um, I think the terminology that Israel used was like hostile citizenry mm. or hostile population or something to that effect. And they had, you know, citizenship and a passport and certain rights that that afforded in terms of like certain levels of freedom of movement and the right to vote in elections. But they were subject to military law while living in Israel and while having Israeli citizenship until 1966. I did not know that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's like something very brushed under the rug. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that was something that like blew my mind when I learned. Yeah. So what's it, what's it like? I mean, tell share some stories. What's it like being this protective presence? What's it like, I guess, living under occupation is the question. What's it like? Um, you know, what what are the stories that you've seen and the and the experiences that you've you know got to got to learn about that that I growing up in in the Jewish world, Orthodox Jewish world, uh, knew nothing about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I guess like the biggest thing that I'm always like constantly that has this like bizarre grim humor to me is growing up in that world and being told pretty unequivocally that if I went into any of these villages, I would be like stabbed on the spot. Oh yeah. You know, and they, people like, still say that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like people, people have literally told me, like, I'll like say some stuff and people will be like, Oh, go to these villages and see how they treat you. And I'm like, yo, I lived in these villages for <laughs> months on it. Like I go back all the time. And in, in contrast, I've been attacked by Israelis a bunch <laughs> like yeah. you know multiple times and kind of it, it's this bizarre the biggest thing I've learned is that even though you know from my end from the activist end like sometimes you go for like a night or two or you know a day or two and like nothing really happens you hang out you know smooth a little read a book maybe it's boring maybe you're like staying active but like nothing happens and then you go home um, but then in a broader sense, I've noticed how like even then it's every day, like something happens every day. Maybe I wasn't there and maybe I didn't react to it and maybe I didn't like go and respond and document to it, but it happened. Someone got arrested. Someone was attacked by settlers. You know, someone had their home demolished or got an eviction notice or got a notice that their home would be demolished. Um, but kind of in terms of, you know, personal stories, I remember when I first went down to do that long stint of like three months protective presence that I was talking about. Um, we we got down, I got down Saturday night and I remember, um, you know, I might mess up the exact dates of these basically, but like Monday, um, these settler kids, like teenagers, you know, stole a Palestinian's phone and we had to like deal, and then we go back in the settlement then we have to call the army and try and help them like go in and get this phone back and obviously like nothing happens uh and then the next day tuesday the army goes into one of the palestinian villages we were staying at um and it's just kind of like you know going all over the place i don't remember if they arrested or anyone or not i don't really think they did usually on these raids they do um and then wednesday there's a bunch of demolitions like you know all over the region um in different villages, you know, some of it's literally just tents being torn down um, because so many of these families, after their homes get demolished, don't rebuild like a you know a full home, just put up a tent. And then Thursday, you know, I was about to like go back home to Jerusalem for the weekend, and these settlers from a nearby settlement with like masks on their face and everything. Um, come and they're they're there to harass this like Palestinian woman shepherding her sheep. There's a soldier right there seeing watching all of this. And they like slingshot like King David slingshot like hurl rocks at us. Um and the soldier is there like yelling at them a little, which is even more than someone do, but not doing a single thing. 
Um, and we videotape all of this and like we go and file a police report. We're standing outside this police station that's, by the way, in a settlement. So Palestinians have like very restricted access to it. Um, and it takes hours to file this report. And I, you know, part of me, like I have ADHD, I'm not built to like sit around doing nothing like that. Part of me is just like, I prefer the rocks, like, yeah. uh, would rather rocks run at me. And that was just kind of, you know, the joke was that it was just like a crash course. Like, yeah, this is life here. Like you just got it all in a week and sometimes a little, it's a little more spread out, but like no one event of that week was so extraordinary that's all just like stuff that happens and things that you yeah. deal with yeah and, and the crucial thing because like some of this the word for this is husbara right so like the propaganda the sort of the canned responses that you hear in in my world you know is like you know well when when we commit violence whenever a settler commits violence they're they're account there's accountability right they'll, they'll get in trouble you know and when the palestinians commit violence you know they don't you know some nonsense like that but the, the key i think the key thing to wake up to to realize is that these acts of violence are not like random criminal acts this is like the consequence of ruling over a population that's deprived of their self determination like when you when you when you treat everyone as a security threat when everyone um when you're when you're in this uh, adversarial relationship where one side has freedom of movement and one side has protection of the police and one side has a protection of the rule of law and one side you know has has voting power and money and one side doesn't these kinds of uh these this type of terrorism this kind of terrorizing uh, abuse of power is just is just inevitable that that's my perspective um does that does that make sense to you do you agree with that yeah yeah absolutely um and to go even further you know there are like ngos that have like statistic of statistic of statistic of how few settler attacks against palestinians face any sort of consequence but to go even further that you know this completely reinforced by the government through a combination of like active support and indifference um, varying from government to government and even the attacks themselves you know that go completely um unpunished are not just random acts of like we're racist and we hate you so we're going to attack you and obviously that's true they are and they do but it's a very concentrated active effort to basically make palestinian life especially in area c of the west bank completely unbearable and unlivable so that they leave um you know that's been that's pretty much like explicit goal amongst a bunch of different far far right groups and, and it's happening um in may multiple villages palestinian villages in the jordan valley you know packed up and fled because things were getting just too horrible um even more have since october 7th both in the jordan valley and the southern part of west bank uh it, it's you know it's a campaign it's not just random acts of violence yeah um how does this how does your activism how has that sort of uh affected your i don't know your social life your your family life your your community has it have you felt the, i mean what i guess what i'm trying to say is this what i what i see what you do i see it like incredible courage and and i i question if i would have had the courage to do what you do in, in your shoes like i i ask myself that question i don't know um and so i guess like what what's the cost like like what you know what what is um like like how scared have you been or, or how how much how much of a price do you feel like you, you you pay for this for this courage if any um first of all thank you um uh, there's definitely you know social blowback and obviously physical risks uh and you know i mentioned before i was always the black sheep and that kind of in a way for sure helps me in this it's kind of like all right you know be more of the black sheep this is just like same old same old um and it, it's definitely had massive social blowback i think kind of not with a bang but with a whimper you know just nobody really yells at me and says like you're dead to me and then like hangs up the phone or whatever and never talks to me again but just kind of like a lot of people friends family whatever that i, I just can't really talk to anymore it's just too hard and stressful and annoying so I, so i don't and so they don't and so we both stop reaching out um and that's really hard um i would say the kind of most like blatant example of like social blowback happened since october 7th and it's actually very re relevant to kind of like the venn diagram of what you know is bringing us together um 
shortly after college, I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, like very natural progression after wrestling. Uh, that was in like 2018. I've been going, um, you know, really going at it for since I started like five and a half years ago. And that was always, I remember like my first practice, I was like, oh, this makes me feel like wrestling does. Like, this is like the only thing even close. And I just like started competing a ton, practicing a ton, the whole thing. Um, and as soon as I got moved to Israel, you know, I kept going with it. I was in this gym in Tel Aviv for a while, moved to Jerusalem. It was COVID, so I was in training for a bit. And then, like, things, you know, got better in terms of the pandemic. And I found this gym in Jerusalem um, and started going. And it was, like, really, really high-level gym. Like, really awesome coaches, some really talented guys in the training room. And that was two – I was there for two years and, like, enjoyed it even and, like – improved a ton, loved the jujitsu, loved the coaching and started to bond with the guys. And, you know, wasn't exactly like vocal about my activism and how I spend, you know, so much of my time, but also like followed guys on social media and they followed me back and like all my accounts are public and that's by design. Um, so anyone who cared to look knew my politics, even if I wasn't like speaking about it a lot. And for a while, despite that, I was like close to some of the, you know, with the guys, like never felt unwelcome, was really developing a good relationship with my coaches. And then um, after October 7th, you know, we don't practice for like a week um, for obvious reasons, you know, everything's closed. Nobody really knows what the hell is going on yet. Um, and then basically after my first practice back after October 7th, my coach is after like, Sam, can we talk to you for a second? And basically, um, I was kicked out of this gym because of my social media posts, you know, they're like, oh, we saw your social media posts. It's really uncomfortable for us. Like, you know, basically tell me that I'm supporting terrorism. And like, I, I go back and like, I've gone back and looked at the social media posts I made since October 7th and like... <laughs> You know, there's nothing that can be remotely misconstrued as me supporting violence or supporting Hamas or anything like that. It's literally just expressing sympathy um, for, you know, the thousands of people in Gaza that have been killed. That number has skyrocketed since then, obviously. Um, and, you know, criticism of and condemnation of like the war effort and the government. Um, but nothing, but obviously nothing but sympathy for the civilians that have been affected. And that was really, you know, bizarre and hurtful and hard. And I think like took me a lot. Like, I think I was just like in shock after it. Um, and like a few weeks later is when the anger started to really bubble up more. And, but the kind of silver lining, I guess, like something really, really cool that's been, that's come out of it is kind of right after that happened. I reached out to this Palestinian coach and black belt I know who like even came down to my wrestling club and did a practice for the kids. And that was really awesome. Um, you know, I reached out to him and just asked if I can go train with him. And he's like, yeah, of course. And I started going there and that's, you know, um, in Shuafat in East Jerusalem. And now I'm training in this all Palestinian gym. And like the first practice I get there, the coach introduces me and tells everyone exactly who I am, what happened. And he says like, oh, he's Jewish, but he's not a Zionist. Um, and it's really cool to be breaking down those walls, you know, be in that space, like completely me, not hiding a single thing. And like, everyone knows exactly who I am, what I am, what I do. And just being the first Jew, you know, and Israeli, like I have Israeli citizenship. Um, and like the more and more time I spend here, the more and more I do start to think of myself as Israeli as Israeli in some capacity. Um, and the first Jewish, you know, Jewish Israeli, Israeli American, whatever that these kids are meeting, these Palestinian kids in East Jerusalem, that like, you know, is its own whole weird thing, like not um quite the same as the West Bank, but, you know, no citizenship, no right to vote in national elections, at least, and, like, very, very um, restricted freedom of movement and a massive militarized police presence in the entire East Jerusalem. And I'm just really the first Jew that these guys are meeting that, like, gives a shit about them, you know, quite frankly, and was, like, fighting for their human rights. So it's just, like, a really, really cool privilege and honor that's come out of, like, a really shitty experience to... Um, be able to break down that wall for them yeah it's amazing i guess if there's one takeaway i'd will, I want people to like 
understand from this is like the, the importance of making these human connections because like I, I grew up in this world where I, I believe that like I knew more about this conflict and the history than, than like anyone else. But like what was missing was like just an, just like a, an understanding of human beings on the other side of that fence. You know what I'm saying? Like that was what was missing. Um, and you just, you, you can't really say, you can't, you don't really know until you, until you meet people, until you see, until you can like imagine and you can experience what the other perspective is, you know, and, and human beings are messy on both sides. Like, like the Zionist camp is full of like, you know, people who are like, like messy and racist and whatever. And like, and that's true of like any large group of people, of course, you know, there's like, there's like human foible and frailty and, and nonsense everywhere. But, um, there's also a, an opportunity to like, yeah, just, just, uh, have a deeper appreciation of the humanity of, of the people that are being affected by your policies and a deeper understanding of, yeah, uh, of, of, of the morality of, of the issues. And so I guess like, like for kids on college campuses, you know, and, 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 and to any extent, like voters and just like, like, you know, be a voice of like, um, like wanting to make connection, you know, no matter what your politics are to me, that feels like, like, just like the first step, just like, just like seek out that human knowledge and experience. Otherwise, without that, you just, you have nothing, you know, you're, 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 you're ignorant, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mentioned before how not even like someone that I became friends with, but just hearing from a Palestinian that like was my age and in college, so had this like human element to him. Um, just hearing him tell ex his experience really opened my eyes so much. Um, and like the bonds that I made here are, you know, so much of what keeps me going, especially like living in these communities for months on end. Um, you know, having so many Palestinian friends that like I'm so, so close with. Um, it it just adds a giant level of understanding, of course. You know, there are things that like you read and read and read, and like so much I've like learned, like all of, like the legal intricacies, and then you just like meet a person suffering under it, and there's nothing that actually replaces that. And also just like the level of investment, you know, especially um after the most recent Israeli election, that was like kind of a landslide for the far right. And after, you know, how horrible and scary October 7th was, and after the horrible, horrible um bombing campaign by the by Israel that followed, and like also like massive suppression of freedom of speech and rampant, you know, settler violence in the West Bank that's really been kicked up a hundredfold since October 7th. Um, you know, there were times in the past year-ish where I kind of for the first time started to not even think about leaving but think about like oh is there a point where I leave is there a point where like it's too dangerous or I can't help anymore or whatever it is and it's just kind of something that always always keeps me here is that you know there I have friends that I care about yeah. and want to stick it out with them and do as much as I can and just you know envision a future where my friend in the West Bank can just drive to Jerusalem and visit me the way that I do, you know, multiple times a week sometimes. Yeah. And I get the other piece of knowledge, which like, I think people sometimes miss on the, on this, on the right side of this divide is like, you're dealing with millions and millions of people. You're not dealing with like just one village. You know, every village is like a story. Every human being is a story of, of oppression or whatever, but like, it's not just like a problem of one town, you know, you're dealing with millions of people who have nowhere to go and and are the more despair you sow and the more you, you, again you can't make peace through the means of violence you know you can't make peace by dropping bombs um and i just think that's like that's such like a an important basic starting point to any discussion of this conflict and, and like any hope for for the future and i think like without that i mean we're just we're just like running to the abyss you know it's like it's such a dark scary um thought to to to, 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 yeah. to miss that you know yeah absolutely i mean and, and like saying you know you can't bomb your way to peace that sounds so obvious that should that should be obvious and clearly it's not and in terms of this specific you know war bombardment whatever word you want to use that like the whole rhetoric in terms of the the people supporting this war is like, you know, even the ones that will hold more, you know, a second's worth of sympathy for the innocent civilians being killed will say, oh, but we need to destroy Hamas. Um, and 
besides for the fact that like the government does not care about destroying Hamas, that is not the motivation of this war. It's like a mixture of a revenge campaign and ethnic cleansing. Um, Netanyahu has, you know, there have been like multiple, multiple articles kind of detailing the fact that Bibi views Hamas as an asset because they're a more advantageous political opponent than, you know, more moderate um, Palestinian political groups and resistant groups and uh, paramilitary groups. But the the point of this war, and we're seeing it, you know, as the evacuation zone of the Gaza Strip marches further and further and south is ethnic cleansing. It's so that, you know, two million people live in this tiny, tiny strip of land and they're just slowly getting shoved farther and farther south. You know, first it's evacuation leaflets in the north and they say, go, you know, go from Gaza City to like neighborhoods more south and then okay, go south again, okay, go south again, okay, go south again. These people have nowhere to go. Egypt's not going to let them in. Israel won't let them out. Um, yeah. And it's just, and, you know, if destroying Hamas, even if that were like a thing that's possible, you know, th- that would happen, you're going to be left with these 2 million people, however many even, you know, survive that. What are they going to? to resort to other than violence after being put through that like what what possible other outcome is there of course yeah if it's okay with you um maybe i could share some some quotes from yeshayao libowitz um yeshayao libowitz is someone that i've i've turned to uh you know his his writings as like someone who just who saw clearly exactly what was happening in 1967 he wrote uh in 1968 the year after the six-day war um he wrote a famous article called the territories and and he continued his life you know onward just being vocal about this like poison pill that like israel has swallowed by like by being greedy by like believing this uh religious nationalist myth of like you know divine right and all the land is ours you know the way in which it's like it's like poisoning israeli society and he saw this like so early on um, and so maybe I'll just use this opportunity since you're here, you know, because to me personally, I find these excerpts uh, refreshing and, and and saddening, but also important to read and, and maybe just share them with you. And, and if we have any reflections on them, um, we can share those. Um, so this is from an interview that Yishai Libus gave in, in like uh, the 80s. So it's a little bit after his initial like essay. But he says, what happened in June 1967 transformed Israel into a conquering power into an instrument for the violent domination of another people. This, I fear, may be the ruin of the state of Israel. The occupation corroded Israel's social fabric, and it has led to a belief in the utility of military force to solve political problems. Um, I think that I think that's so powerful. This, you know, this this like assumption of um, yeah, the only way is violence. It's, it's like there's no belief in like the capacity for a peace process anymore, it seems. There's no belief in the in like in the humanity of like these other people. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's one quote that, that speaks to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I would even go as far as say, you know, it, it, it started before 67, you know, that conquering mentality, um, with like far right paramilitary groups before 48, even, and for sure in 48, um, and DC, you know, from, you know, obviously incredibly smart, incredibly knowledgeable, people like Yishai Leibowitz and other people, how clear the writing on the wall was, how many of these people quoted, you know, predicted to a T 20, 30, 40 years ago, what we'd be looking at now, you know, now we're seeing from more left to center to liberal to left-wing groups talk about how the occupation of the West Bank is, is that poison in Israeli society and that all of the methods of control over Palestinians in the West Bank are leaking over into Israel itself and over any sort of political dissidents. And it's, on one hand, it's so sad because it's so frustrating and horrible. And, you know, to know that people saw this coming a million miles away. But on the other hand, it's inspiring to me to know that there were always people speaking out against these things and there always will be. And, you know, there's always going to be a resistance movement. Yeah. He says that the transformation of Israel into a colonial power started with Golda Meir. Um, she claimed there was no Palestinian people, but the Palestinians consider themselves to be a people. And that is the decisive point. Most historians and sociologists 
deny the existence of a Jewish people. However, we are not interested in the opinion of other people as to whether the Jewish people really exist. It's our business, not anyone else's. And the same goes for the Palestinians. It's not Israel's business to decide whether a Palestinian people exist or not exist. I think it's also really powerful. Yeah, yeah, that's so powerful. And it really just like hits home to how, you know, I think both of us grew up like, nobody uttered the word Palestinian, it's just Arab. And, you know, if, if Palestinian comes up, it's like, oh, they're Jordanian, it's a made up ethnicity, and like all ethnicities are made up, or, you know, it's all just like this abstract bond over um, cultural and social ethnic similarities. But, you know, that hits home so much. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Can you can you share with us uh, the, the organizations that you are affiliated with um, so we can, you know, get your work and your message out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, just kind of my almost all of my activism is through a group called All That's Left. Uh, you know, we're on it's very, very grassroots, but we're on uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at ATLCOL. Um, also very, they've done a lot of work with an organization called the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. Uh, same thing, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, CJMV. And, you know, also, it's so important to follow Palestinian groups and hear their side. I do a lot of work with a group called Youth of Sumud, uh, S-U-M-U-D, and, you know, and just follow, you know, Palestinian kind of activists and journalists. A good friend of mine, Basil Adra, has a very big, big platform. Uh, and and me, you know, I, I post a lot about my activism on social media. I'm particularly active on Instagram. My handle is, is Sam underscore Abraham and really hope that, you know, people will follow me and uh, stay up to date and, you know, see see what's actually happening. Yeah, um, I will make a donation to all that's left. Um, is, where else do you recommend people donate? Um, I, there are a few fundraisers that will be going, you know, um, I definitely would say CJMD that has like a more robust kind of like all that's left is completely grassroots collective. We don't have a bank account. <laughs> um, CJMD does have a bank account that has done an incredible job of raising funds for Palestinian communities in the West Bank affected by, um, you know, the post October 7th reality, so to speak. Um, so highly, highly encourage everyone to, you know, to give them or whatever donation you're willing or able to give. Awesome. Okay. So those links will all be down below. Um, and I will be making a donation. Uh, Sam, thank you so much, uh, for, for talking to me. Uh, this has been yeah, yeah really, you. really, really important. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me and, uh, have a, have a good evening.